I would like to introduce the Axion Dark Matter at Stockholm University Research Environment. My name is David Marsh, and I'm an assistant professor here at the physics department. This research environment is generously funded by a grant from the Swedish Science Council, VR, and it also receives support from the European Research Council, ERC. Our research environment brings together condensed matter experimentalists, condensed matter theorists, cosmologists, particle experimentalists, as well as theorists. I believe that it, it leverages some of the strengths here at the Stockholm University, and it identifies new and exciting angles on an important topic. In this video, I would like to tell you about the background of the problem we're considering, who's involved, and what we plan to do. Fundamental physics concerns the building blocks of nature and how they fit together. The current state of the art of fundamental theory comprises the standard model of particle physics, which is a quantum mechanical description of a, a handful of particles and how they interact, and bolted onto this Einstein's theory of general relativity, which describes gravity. This state of the art has been developed over the past several centuries. And it's really remarkably successful, both experimentally and observationally. However, we also know that excellent as it may be, this state of the art is not the final story. There are properties and phenomena in nature that cannot be explained by these theories. The first piece of evidence that we're missing something comes from a problem in the standard model that I'll here refer to as the problem with the theta angle. The standard model has a free parameter, theta. It's an angle. It takes a value between zero degrees and 360 degrees. And on general grounds, we expect some random value in this range. This angle theta does one curious thing. It tweaks the charge distribution of the neutron. The neutron is a neutral particle, so it has electric charge zero. However, in principle, uh, the charge distribution of the neutron can be a little bit asymmetric. Uh, it may have a little bit more positive charge on top, so to speak, and a little bit more negative charge at the bottom. This theta angle induces precisely such an asymmetry. Experiments over the past seven decades have searched for this asymmetry, but come up with nothing. The neutron charge distribution appears perfectly uniform. This can be translated into a limit on theta. And presently, we know that this angle is no larger than five parts in a billionth of a degree. This is a stunningly tight bound um, some, for something that, that had no reason to, to be this small. To appreciate just how tight this bound is, uh, consider an analogy. Suppose uh, we meet outside the physics department at Stockholm University, which is housed in the Albanova building in, in Stockholm. Suppose I tell you, um, I've lost my key card. I can't get in. And I ask for your help to recover it. You kindly agree. And then I tell you that, um, I don't know how far away it is, but I know for sure it's on a straight line from here. It may be on some random location along this line. So very kindly, uh, you go out to search for it following this path. This takes you first through Stockholm, almost straight south, then across the Baltic Sea, uh, down through Poland, through Europe, crossing Africa. You go down to Antarctica, looping up uh, over the Pacific, and then down, back, uh, down again um, across the, the Arctic Sea, uh, back to Stockholm and Albanova. And we'll meet again outside the entrance of the physics department. You follow the straight path. You search very carefully. You find no key card. Indeed, so when you return to me, you've done your search so thoroughly that you are able to put a strong limit on the whereabouts of my key card. You're able to say that it must be no further 
from my chest pocket than at most half a millimeter. Having done this search, uh, you may not feel entirely content with my description that the key card is probably at some random location along this line, since it's really, well, along this line, but really in my pockets all along. Similarly, particle physicists feel the same way about the theta angle. Its smallness is not just a fluke. It requires a proper explanation. A second important reason why the fundamental theory is incomplete comes from the sky. This is a full sky mosaic image uh, taken from the infrared spectrum. In blue, we see the imprint of the galaxy, and in green, this light coming predominantly from extragalactic sources. What's apparent in any image like this is the clumpiness of the distribution of matter on, 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 on in the universe. This is puzzling because in a modern understanding of cosmology, we know that these inhomogeneities should have come from a process like this. Small seed perturbations planted early on in the, early in the universe in a Big Bang cosmology uh, propagated through time and grew larger and larger. And one can calculate how large uh, these inhomogeneities would, would grow, so how clumpy the universe would become. And if the standard model and general relativity is all there is, these inhomogeneities would be roughly 10%. The universe would be nowhere as clumpy as we see it today. The absolute forerunner explanation for explaining the clumpiness of the universe is that there's just more matter in the universe than contained in the standard model of particle physics. There's additional matter, there's invisible matter that we haven't detected, that we, doesn't emit light, that we cannot see, but that acts gravitationally and that has set up an invisible network throughout the universe where our ordinary visible matter gravitationally falls and creates galaxies and, and stuff we can see. And in particular, each galaxy in the universe is surrounded by an invisible halo of this invisible unknown matter. This invisible matter is called dark matter and evidence for it does not just come from cosmology, from the structure of the universe as a whole, but also from galaxies' behavior on their own and a number of different uh, observations over several different scales. We don't know much about dark matter, uh, but what we do know is that it must interact very weakly with ordinary matter, if at all, uh, other than gravitationally. Furthermore, we know that it's kinetic energy. It's much less than its mass. It's moving slowly. The axion is a hypothetical particle um, first conceived in the late 70s by um, Weinberg and Bulczyk following a proposal um, by Peche and Quinn. And it provides a, a very attractive solution both to the problem of the theta angle and to the nature of dark matter. In its essence, the axion makes the theta angle of the standard model into a dynamical field. It has a field, it's a field with a, a potential energy, which looks like, like, like this, um, which has a minimum at zero. So uh, the, the, the field will relax into this minimum and we shouldn't expect to find the, the value of the theta angle anywhere else than at this, this value. In my analogy with the key card, uh, this is equivalent of saying that I've attached my key card to a spring, which means that even if I drop it in the Pacific, say, it returns to my pocket and, and stays there. Now, cosmologically, we expect uh, the axiom to start out at some random value in this potential, not necessarily at zero. And through cosmological history, it will want to make its way down the potential 
to the minimum. But in doing so, it will start to oscillate around the minimum of the potential. And it turns out that such oscillations of a field um, is equivalent cosmologically to a collection of particles that have kinetic energy much, much less than their mass. Furthermore, the axion is naturally very weakly coupled to matter. And for natural values of the parameters in the theory, uh, it can give the right abundance of dark matter. So over the past few years, the axion dark matter proposal has emerged as a leading contender to explain this longstanding problem in cosmology. And now the hunt is on. Um, we know the following. The axion theory has one free parameter, the mass of the axion. We also know that the axion has a weak coupling to uh, electromagnetism. And this coupling to electromagnetism is now used by experiments across the globe to search for the axion and to zoom in to on, on various bits of the parameter space. The race is on to discover the particle if it exists. This is where the axion dark matter research environment comes in. Uh, our newly founded research environment, founded in 2020, uh, brings together cosmologists, particle physicists, and condensed matter physicists to develop new ways to search for the axion. The hope is to, to leverage the various strengths that we already have here, create a, a cross-disciplinary approach to this problem that is able to compete and overtake the international competition and, and which may in the long run uh, lead to experiments that can discover, can discover the axiom. The senior members of this collaboration is Stefano Bonetti, an international expert in ultrafast phenomena in experimental condensed matter physics. Physics is a pioneer of, of terahertz magnetism and has a terahertz lab set up in Stockholm. We have John Conrad, who's an experimentalist with a strong track record on axion dark matter searches. He's had a leading involvement in, in both gamma ray telescopes and the Xenon experimental dark matter program. We have Jon Gudmundsson, who is an expert in the development of instrumentation for satellite, balloon, and, and ground-based experiments. His experience include a spider experiment, which is the most uh, advanced stratospheric science instrument to date, um, and a calibration of the uh, Planck satellite by ESA. Um, I'm involved in this research environment. My background is in theoretical particle physics, cosmology, and astroparticle physics. Um, on work that includes setting astrophysical limits on axions. We have Professor Hiranya Peris, who is the leader and principal investigator of this environment. She's an internationally uh, recognized leading expert working on a broad range of, of data uh, from the CMB uh, to galaxy and, and quasar, quasar surveys. And she also does theoretical work also on early universe uh, cosmology. She's been a key member of the WMAP and Planck teams that investigated the cosmic microwave background. We have Frank Wilczek, a Nobel Prize winning physicist who has made foundational contributions to quantum field theory, particle physics, quantum mechanics, quantum matter uh, physics, and, and cosmology. He was one of the two independent co-discoverers um, of the axiom in, in, in theory um, as a result of the Hedge Quinn mechanism. Um, and he was one of the first people to propose uh, axion dark matter as a prediction uh, from Big Bang cosmology. We have furthermore, some really excellent postdocs in this environment. We have Matthew Lawson, who's an expert in condensed matter experimental techniques, in particular with the application to axion detection. We have Alex Miller, who's an expert in the theory of axion experiments and in axion photon conversion. And both Matthew and Alex have very broad skill sets and they're active contributors to most activities in this environment. We have Keir Rogers, who's a cosmologist with expertise in hydrodynamical simulation of the so-called Lyman Alpha forests. Um, he's now an alumni. He's moved on to the Dunlap Institute 
at the University of Toronto. We also have Tom Edwards, who's an expert in astroparticle and, and gravitational wave physics. We also have a number of local associates. We have Alexander Balatsky, who is a theoretical condensed matter professor at the Nordic Institute of Theoretical Physics, Nordita, here in Stockholm, uh, located just next to the physics department. Um, and he's an expert in, in strongly correlated quantum systems. We have Andreas Ryd, who's an associate professor leading a lab in experimental condensed matter physics here at Stockholm. In addition, we have several additional collaborators as well as really excellent PhD students who are involved in this work. The Axion Dark Matter project has three interconnected parts or work packages as illustrated in, in the figure here. Um, and in this talk, I would like to briefly introduce each one of them, starting with the Axion Plasmon Haloscope. To search for the axion, one would like to convert it from being an axion to be a, a particle that we can detect in our ordinary detectors. In particular, we want to convert it to a photon in most cases. The traditional way of doing so is um, to set up a, a microwave cavity um, where the frequency of the eigenmodes in this cavity is tuned in such a way that they're equal to the mass of the axion. And in this way, one can match energy and momentum conservation, which is necessary in order for the axion to be able to convert into a photon. These cavities can be tuned um, by moving around and changing the size of a rod located inside the, um, the microwave cavity as illustrated in this figure over here from the ADMX experiment. The new idea uh, of this research environment and proposed um, by Lawson, Miller and, and Frank Wilczek in a, in a paper from last year from 2019 uh, and their collaborators is to instead use uh, plasma. Now, one would still need to match the energy conservation and momentum conservation, but to do so in a plasma, one can make use of the fact that the photon in a plasma uh, obtains a mass from the environment, from the fact that there are lots of electrons uh, around in this environment, lots of charged particles. Now, um, this is a picture of um, a, a, um, a plasma lamp, and a plasma lamp is not a very good axion detector. Uh, one would need a cold environment in order to, to, to detect axions. And furthermore, one would need it controlled, and one would need a plasma frequency that's typically many orders of magnitude smaller than one finds in off-the-shelf usual materials. So the new idea here is to use something called metamaterials. Metamaterials are, are materials that are engineered to have properties that are not found in, in naturally occurring materials. Uh, the simplest example is just a parallel set of wires. The effective photon mass in any one of these wires uh, will be high, much larger than the axion mass is expected to be. But the stack of wires can act collectively as a new material uh, with an effective photon mass that's tunable by changing the spacing between the, the wires. These wires can be placed in a cryogenic environment, uh, which is needed to become sensitive to the action background. And these uh, wired materials is, is an example of a, a wide class of materials called metamaterials um, that can in principle be used for axion detection. The potential for these type of searches is quite promising. This plot illustrates the, the, the projected reach of this experiment. So on the horizontal axis, we have the free parameter, the, the axion mass. 
And on the vertical axis, we have the, the coupling to photons, the strength of the coupling to photons. And the expected values is somewhere here between sort of, um, around one and, and a few um, between those two lines. That's where you expect to find the axion if it exists, though the mass is, is not known. So this plasma halo scope, as it's called, uh, would be able to search this green region over here. Um, and it's competitive with lots of other proposed experiments. So in this plot, all the colorful um, um, boxes and regions um, correspond to different proposed experiments. And the gray regions correspond to bounds that are actually there at the present. So this indicates how much activity there's currently going on in this field, and that this idea of a plasma haloscope will probe a significant part of the relevant parameter space. New development this year have included detailed simulations of the wired metamaterials as axion detectors, pioneered in particular by, by Jon Gudmundsson. Um, in addition, uh, a collaboration with a group at UC Berkeley has been set up um, to build prototypes that realize these wired metamaterials and illustrate how they can be placed in a cryogenic environment and tuned. The second work package is on axion astronomy. How can we use astronomy and cosmology to search for axions? Here, Hiranya Peris and former postdoc Kiri Rogers have already produced some very powerful results that apply to the lowest end of the possible spectrum of dark matter masses. Now, if the mass of the axion is sufficiently low, it will have uh, the Broglie wavelength, which is astronomical, which means that it will behave more like a wave on astronomical scale than a localized particle. This means that there's a minimum length scale below which matter cannot clump. This is a prediction from the theory, which can be tested by data. Um, and since this involves cosmology, it um, also involves lots of astrophysical uncertainties that need to be taken into account. What Kier and Hiranya has done in this work is to uh, carefully take those astrophysical uncertainties into account by building what's called a Bayesian emulator. And then they've applied this new tool um, to, um, to, to, to search for the axion in observational data from something called the Lyman Alpha forests. Uh, they didn't find an axion and they were able to put new world leading limits on ultralight axions. Um, and their work rules out uh, the canonical parameter space for a type of model called fuzzy dark matter, which have been much discussed over the past few years. Moreover, in this research environment, a few of us are thinking about axion astronomy and how axions can be realized in astrophysical environments. Um, here, what we're interested in is that in the standard mass range, the axion can convert into a photon in extreme astrophysical environment, such as the, the magnetic fields around neutron stars, for instance. A non-relativistic axion naturally converts into a photon in the radio spectrum. So in a radio wavelength photon uh, with frequencies of around say 0.1 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. And uh, axion photon conversion in astrophysical environments uh, can give rise to, to signals uh, that are quite distinctive, that one can say does not come from any astrophysical process. What we hope to do is to identify and characterize such signals uh, from promising and extreme astrophysical environments 
and then search for these in radio data. Um, and one may in particular use reuse data that has been taken in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, so-called SETI data. With this data, we may identify candidate signals that could come from an axion, and then feed this back to experiments searching for the axion, helping them to know what's part of the parameter space they should tune their experiments to. This will, this is possible that, that this will shortcut the way to discovering the axiom by combining astrophysics with experiments. The final work package is called quantum matter for axiom detection. Collective excitations in, in many particle systems uh, have, uh, can themselves behave uh, like particles. Um, and these collective excitations may couple to, to the axion. So part of this project is to um, compute a coupling between um, these collective excitations and the axion, and to use a database with machine learned properties of organic materials to identify suitable candidate materials. Then we would synthesize these and characterize them using terahertz time domain spectroscopy. This last part will determine how these materials can be tuned, for instance, by straining them, by changing the temperature or by optically pumping them. This project will also develop um, single photon counters in the terahertz region, which is um, needed to detect a signal and to, to read the axion signal out if it's there. This is an uh, ambitious proposal with several parts that involves the collaboration both between experimentalists and theorists. So to conclude, the Axion Dark Matter at Stockholm University research environment is an active and evolving part of Physicum now. We have several weekly meetings and we anticipate to generate lots of activity in terms of scientific papers, workshops, meetings, talks, etc. To follow these developments, um, the developments of this research environment, we have set up a web page um, beautifully put together by, by June, uh, Matthew, and Hiranja. And if you'd like to know more about our research environment, please check the various pages on this web page and, and keep tuned. Thanks.